we go back to our parable. So we're in listening to our Lord's words in Luke chapter 5, verse 34. Luke 5, 34, 35. Let me look at that, and then we're going to just walk through some scripture in relationship to fasting. What I'm going to want to talk about is Old Testament fasting versus New Testament fasting. And hopefully we can uh, get a picture of what the difference between the two is in relationship to the difference between the two uh, covenants, Old Covenant and New. We saw how, and we emphasize this a couple of times, the difference between the behavior of John the Baptist and his disciples, the Pharisees and their disciples. Disciples. It was radical enough of a difference for the Pharisees and even John's disciples to ask what, why did not Jesus' disciples fast. So again, I want to I want to make sure that we understand that what we're looking at is a behavior pattern of the disciples of Christ that correspond with an understanding of what it means for the bridegroom to be present. And that becomes the grounds upon which there's a difference between a time of fasting and a time where fasting is inappropriate. So we read again in verse 35, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. That's a severance of the head from the body, the bride from the bridegroom. And then shall they fast in those days. So what we want to do now is take advantage of an opportunity to simply meditate on the concept of fasting, its relationship to scripture, both in the old and in the new. Because apparently there are elements in the which, within even the framework of the new covenant, the gospel, that there are times when the people of God in new covenant theology fast. And I want to actually call our attention to two kinds. The old covenant kind, which can be practiced even in the new covenant, an old covenant mode of fasting. You'll see that as we work our way through these points. And then what I call new covenant fasting or gospel fasting, which is the fast that Christ is calling us to. I'm going to open in a word of prayer. I'm going to remind you of the three areas in which the bridegroom was taken away, and then we're going to look at a number of scripture in relationship to fasting in the Old Testament and then make our way through the new so we can build a synopsis of what this means. Father, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for the class here tonight. Thank you for the class online. Thank you for granting us a hunger to... uh, to know what Christ says to us and what it means deeply and profoundly and and personally and relationally and psychologically and emotionally and spiritually and redemptively, all the things that pertain to our salvation, which is in him alone. Grant us grace for this hour. Grant those that are coming on the ability to comprehend the importance of living out and expressing what it means to be a new covenant, New Testament Christian while Christ is present with us and what it means when we are in those times and seasons when his sensible presence is not adequate or we are under levels of duress that would require us to fast and to pray. We ask this with the opening of our eyes and our mind by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So, all right, the first time that you read about fasting in your Bible really is in the book of Judges. This is the first time. That's a long way up because we are, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then all of a sudden Joshua and then Judges. We're seven books in before fasting comes along. What does that mean? That means fasting was not some hard, rigid, regulatory principle by which the people of God engaged in, even under Torah, even under the law system. In the patriarchal period, there was fasting, but fasting was not a prominent feature in the life of the people of God. You didn't find the people of God frequently 
abstaining from food, frequently given to uh, times of mourning and grieving, and again, uh, engaging in a, a, a level of, um, of fasting that would uh, uh, connote some kind of trouble, some kind of struggle, some kind of pain, some kind of difficulty. You wouldn't find that. Uh, and therefore, here we go from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers to Deuteronomy to Joshua and then Judges. And then all of a sudden in the book of Judges, you see an event where fasting takes place. And we're going to be looking at several fasting events. Uh, glad to have you guys in the house. You, you, uh, do you get an outline? Are you, you could, okay, all right, but they're back there if you want it. Otherwise, you can keep up with your, with your Bible. Good to see you. Um, this is jo uh, Judges chapter 20, verse 26. And I'm going to, for the time's sake, kind of talk you through what's going on here. And I want you to see that there are a number of similarities in almost all of the Old Testament fasting scenarios. Fasting was done in the Old Testament when the people of God were in danger. Fasting was done in the Old Testament in the life of the people of God when the people of God were in danger. Fasting was done in the Old Testament when the people of God were suffering defeat in war. Suffering defeat in war. Fasting was done in the Old Testament times when the people of God were under threat of death where something was going to be taken away, life was going to be taken away. They were in danger, uh, in war, under threat of death. That's what you need to know. And this is what I was saying about the kind of perfunctory mode of fasting that goes on in our generation where people will uh, fast and they do it in a kind of laudy uh, advertisement mode <clears throat> of telling everybody what they're up to what kind of fast they are engaging in and all of the ingredients that go into their fasting. That's not fasting biblically. There's not duress there. There's not urgency, exigencies. It's not a compelling on the part of the soul to isolate itself to God. And, uh, and so w we might be able to infer this as I lay the foundation about fasting. Fasting would have been like worshiping. It would have been assumed, not necessarily explicitly stated, like there were no laws written up in the Old Testament in the patriarchal period that you had to worship God on this day and in this way. They all just knew how to worship God. You guys hearing what I'm saying? It's important for you to think this. So it was inferred because it was part of the culture. You didn't have to teach somebody how to worship. You didn't have to teach somebody how to pray when they were in trouble. Okay, so it's important for you to understand that fasting should never be taken up by purchasing books on how to learn how to fast in order to get God to give you something. Now, this is, I just want to lay this foundation for a while because what you would be indi indicating by that mechanism, you would be indicating that somehow God can be manipulated. You would be indicating that God could be manipulated by a, an agreement on your part to abstain from certain normalcies that are freely yours, given to you by God, in order to kind of strong arm God, like people do when they go on these kind of protest fasts in prison to get the administration in the prison system to change policies. You guys understand what I'm talking about? Well, that's not how you, that's not how that goes. So in Genesis 20, verse 26, notice what the text says. And the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God. And the first thing they did was what? They wept and sat before the Lord and fasted that day until even. And then at evening offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the first fundamental principle here is that their fasting is not in the presence of men. It's in the presence of who? All right, this is why your master said in Matthew 6, do not do anything to be seen of men. The moment you do it to be seen of men, it has no validity in heaven. All right. So this was the account where 
where the 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 um <clears throat> the children of Israel were actually going to a major war with their own tribe, the Benjamite brethren and the Gibeonites. They had all fallen into some extremely sinful disarray. And, and Israel and, and, and Benjamin were at war. And Benjamin was a warrior uh, tribe, so they were able to get down. So what the Israelites were praying about was to whether or not it was God's will for them to even go against their brethren because the possibility of annihilism would take place. And they didn't just want to annihilate their brethren. So this is kind of a situation where they said, you know, we're going to pause, cry out to God, we're going to weep because we don't know what to do. And we're going to wait on God for an answer. And if you were to keep reading the text, you would know that God gave an answer. The next time I want you to see is in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. In the Samuel text, we have the same situation going on where there's a danger. There's a dire strait and um and, uh, and, and the children of Israel are calling upon the Lord. Let me start back at verse 5. Maybe that will help a context here. 1 Samuel 7, verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Verse 6. And they gathered together in Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. This is called a free will offering. To pour the water out is to acknowledge that water is a precious gift from God, and we're pouring it out rather than drinking it in Rather than satiating our own body, we're going to forego the satiation of our body in order to make contact with the true and the living God because our situation is so dire that rather than drink water, which we have a right to do, we're going to pour it out to the Lord because we want God to hear us. These kind of... Uh, 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 what would be called oblation offerings were often offered by the priests and offered by the king when they won battles. That they wouldn't take of the spoil and eat it right away, but pour it out to God, thanking him for it. And water is a spoil. Water is a precious gift. And so they're saying, no, I'm not going to drink water because my situation is, is bad. And I want to make sure that God understands that we are in need of him. And it says... And so they poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, There, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And if you already know that account, here's what you know. They had just went to war against the Philistines. And the Philistines summarily routed them. And the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. So Israel got their butt whooped that day. And what they discovered was they went to war without asking God for his grace. And so they, they said, let's put this thing in reverse, which is a beautiful thing. Christians don't understand how important the letter R is. It's called repentance. It shorts circuit consequences quickly when you have the dexterity of soul to put it in reverse and back up out of a behavior pattern that you come to discover this is not the will of God. Like a lot of us will bump our heads constantly as if, you know, we're going to just make God do what we want to do. If it doesn't work, back out. If you hit a dead end, back out. So that's what they did. And of course, God gave them victory by virtue of their repentance. But what did they do? They fasted before the Lord. Here's another one. First Samuel 31 31. First Samuel 31, 31. Why are the children of Israel fasting now and praying? First Samuel 31, 3 says, and the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hit him and he was sore wounded of the archers. Now give me first Samuel 31, 31, please. And this will actually sum up what occurred. Okay. Do, do we have, what's the last verse in first Samuel 30, 30, 13? That's the one I want. That's my dex. That's my uh, dyslexia kicking in. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Took whose bones? The bones of Saul and Jonathan who had died in war. So Israel uh, took up a national fast because they lost their king. And if you were to go right over into chapter 2 around verse 12, uh, chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, David did the same thing. David fasted because of a loss of the king. That was a serious issue, losing the king. It was worthy of crying out to the Lord. Uh, in second, in first Kings chapter, um, first Kings chapter, uh, 
21 verse 27, we're going to look at one more Old Testament account. This happened a few times, but in 1 Kings 21, 27, this is what we read. <clears throat> and it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes. That's one thing. Put on sackcloth. That's two things upon his flesh. And then fasted and lay in sackcloth and walked about what? Very softly. So he went through a whole display of what can be summed up under one word. Humility. Right. So he took off his royal garb. This was not any kind of fanfare. He wasn't trying to show out. What he was doing was recognizing that God's judgment was on him as a king. And he recognized that he had no right to wear the fine apparel of a king. He took his fine apparel off. He put on sackcloth and ashes. He went about mourning. And the text says he went about softly. That means he walked with humility. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Because all of those elements play a role in the attitude of of fasting in the Old Testament. It's an indication of loss. It's an indication of danger. It's an indication, indication of imminent threat. It's an indication of need. And none of the accounts that I share with you this uh, uh, so far, none of these accounts will you find as a, lit, a liturgy in the book of Leviticus. God did not give them a liturgy of fasting. These were all intuitive, uh, authentic, and genuine expressions of existential threat that led them to tell their bodies, we're taking a break from everything but God. Right, so I just want you to know that. And that process has honor so long as you don't tell anybody. The moment you tell somebody, then you might as well know you are lying to yourself. The moment that you go, you know, honey, I'm getting ready to go on a seven day fast, then stop. Because you're lying to yourself. You're not under any exigential threat. You're not in any urgency. You now want to do something and you want somebody to pray for you. Pray for me while I fast. No, I ain't praying for you. Jesus said, don't pray for you because he told you don't ask me to pray for you. Because he told you, don't tell anybody what you're doing, just do it. So it's, what I'm doing is laying down a foundation for what fasting was. It was never taught as a preceptive, preceptive liturgy. It was always inferred. The people of God caught it like you caught, eat, caught eating or you caught worshiping. You did not have to actually do anything. The next time we read about fasting, we will look now in Nehemiah chapter 1, 4, <clears throat> and I can run through these fairly quickly because in the, in the major prophets, fasting was called for whenever there was war at hand, Joel called for the solemn fast. Call for the solemn fast. The nations are coming. You're going to be destroyed. Hit the ground. Hit the face. Blow the trumpet. Call for a solemn fast. And here it is again. I'm sorry. First Kings 21, 7. We looked at that. Nehemiah 1, 4, please. This is where Nehemiah now has heard the report about the condition of Israel in Palestine, several hundred miles away from Persia. And notice what the text said. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and the first thing I did was what? Now that came up before, didn't it? Weeping. The second thing he did was what? And the third thing he did was fasted and prayed where again? Before God. He didn't pray to anyone else. He didn't share this with anyone else. It was his own personal labor before God. Now, you, you can think about that right there as we begin to move forward and understand that you will learn some things if you decided that you wanted to try to gain or acquire God's attention. And, and that would never be a bad thing to do. It would never be a bad thing to do to try to gain or acquire God's attention on your part. Um... That would never be wrong. You could you could try that and, and be ready to discover whether or not you are capable of being sincere. You could try that. There would never be anything wrong with it. I, I only say that is because if you don't live in a situation 
where real existential threats prevail in your life, if you create a fictitious urgency, then you're probably not going to go through all of these machinations of fasting. You might start off pretending I'm fasting at 6 o'clock in the morning. But all between 6 o'clock in the morning and 12 o'clock noon, all your mind is is on food. <clears throat> You're not fasting. You're not fasting. And, and uh, you know, by the time 6 o'clock in the evening comes, you've modified your fast. Because now you're going to meet a certain creature comfort. Understand, you're not fasting. Two things. You're not fasting, and you didn't have to. God didn't ask you to do it. Do you understand that? Now, Pastor, why are you saying that? Because right now, you and I, in the course of a year, or maybe years now, have not fasted. Years. It's been years for me. Somebody else. All right. So everybody else raising their hands means y'all been fasting. All right. I know that. I know not. Because if we're talking about an Old Testament type of fasting, this has to do with very serious issues. Very serious issues. For which, if you were fasting, you would know what the benefits are. And they wouldn't be losing weight. And it wouldn't be just the discipline you own, your eating habits. And, uh, and it wouldn't be, watch this now before we move to the next point, it wouldn't be for vain goals. It wouldn't be for vain goals. Right, think about the goodness of God in giving you and me food and raiment and, and healthy immune systems and healthy digestive tracts and healthy uh, hunger, pains to eat. Are those gifts from God? Is it a gift from God to get up every day healthy and have a hunger to eat? Yes. Is it a gift of God to be able to eat and derive from those foods the nutrients necessary to strengthen our bodies? Right. So what we don't want to think is that the normal everyday life of God providing for you and me in the area of uh, food and drink is somehow a lesser state of being. Is not. You are not more spiritual when you eat less. You are not. Please hear what I'm saying. This is why I'm taking my time. Because a lot of New Testament folks operate out of Old Testament principles, violating the Old Testament principles in a New Testament context, where in a New Testament context, you even, you even less need to be employing an Old Testament principle because of the radical difference between the Old Testament context and the New Testament context. While the bridegroom is with them, they don't need to fast. All right, so here you got Jesus with you. You have Jesus in the preaching and the teaching of the word. You have Jesus in your heart by regeneration. You have Jesus in the fullness of your method of devotion and Bible study and prayer. You got Jesus in the fellowship of the saints. You got Jesus on the radio, Jesus on the YouTube, Jesus on your phone. You got Jesus all over the place. And you're going to act like you don't have Jesus, so you're going to start fasting. Are you following what I'm getting at? Right, so when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, he says, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? You can't. There will be no internal compunction. There will be no internal drive. There will be no existential threat. There will be no hunger. There will be no, no devastation. There will be no death. It was David fasting, I believe it was, in uh, uh, 2 Samuel, when his son was about to die. When his son was about to die, and the moment that his son died, David got up from the fasting, washed his face, and went and ate some eggs and bacon and, and, and grits. And they said, David, what you doing? He says, while my son was yet alive, it might have been that God would have heard me. But now that he is dead, my job is not to manipulate God to, to raise my son from the dead in order that my son might be with me. As if to be with me is better than for him to be with God. 
Are you guys hearing? So David blew them away. But that David was a gospel man. He, he knew the gospel well. He knew that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord, that that child is in glory because of his covenant uh, safety. And so David says, I'll go to him, but he ain't coming back to me. He said, God chose to take him and God's wisdom is not going to be vetoed by my fasting. All right. So so I'm driving that home because. It's important for you and I to know that there are times when God just is going to plainly say, I'm not listening to you just because you're fasting. Jeremiah 14, 12. I want you to see this. Jeremiah 14, 12. Jeremiah 14, 12. This is where we're going to start moving and turning the corner on the fast concept. Start back at verse 10, will, will you? Here's what God says to Jeremiah, and I love this. Thus saith the Lord unto this people. Thus have they loved to wander. He says, these are the people that wander from me, leave off from me. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and do what? That's dreadful. Do you understand how dreadful that is? So just to frame it, just in case you're not grounded. Had they refrained their feet from evil... Had they not wandered off from the covenant, they would have been under the blessing of God's favor, which said there will be no enemy that can defeat you. They will come at you one way and you will scatter them seven ways. One of you will run off ten, a hundred of you will run off a thousand. You will never have enemies come and dominate you arbitrarily as if I am not the Lord your God, if you do what I tell you to do. So they said, no, nah, we're not going to do what God tells us to do. And therefore, God says, if you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do, that means I'm not Lord. And if I'm not Lord, then you still have no one who has forgiven you of your sins. Now you're still under the consequences of your own rebellion and disobedience. And I have to act towards you as if you are my adversary. Does that make sense? All right, so God is simply only being, he's only honoring his covenant stipulations. If you're going to act like an enemy towards God, God says, I'm going to act like an enemy towards you. With the forward, God will show himself what? That's right. Notice what it says in verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, do not pray for this people for their good. All right. So let's contextualize that because we're about to move into the next verse. Let's contextualize that. There's a good likelihood that none of you will ever receive a direct imperative from God like this ever, and you should not want to. There's a good likelihood that none of you will ever receive an imperative from God to tell you not to pray for somebody, and you would not want to. Here's the reason why. If God were to tell you to not pray for somebody... It does not follow that when God tells you to not pray for that person, that your heart is going to be in alignment with God. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself that every, God, every thought that God has are thoughts that you and I will agree with. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? So I'm trying to nurture a point here. So Jeremiah is doing what God is telling him to do, not because Jeremiah agrees with God in everything. Jeremiah has been all over the map with what God is up to, and Jeremiah is struggling himself. And so, you know, I mean, this, is it possible for God to have people that he's not going to pray for that you definitely want to pray for? I, and you go, what? Don't pray for them. Now I'm tripping with you, God. Right? Because you're human and you are volitional creatures and you do not always think God's thoughts after him. I don't care what you think. And therefore, I don't necessarily need God telling me to do anything that he knows that I don't want to do. I don't need him to, to put me in a situation where I'm going to wrestle with his will in that way. Jeremiah got stuck there. Jeremiah stuck there. You can get the answer to this in Jeremiah 20, but we won't go there. <clears throat> Jeremiah is dealing with a hard 
hard-hearted, stiff-necked group of people whom he both loves and hates. And he's been witnessing to them, and he's been witnessing to them, and he's not yet giving up on them. But God's been witnessing to them way longer than Jeremiah. And God in his judiciary, in his, in his, his scrutiny of judgment is saying, I, right, I'm going to exercise a judicial right to release these people from my blessing right here. Jeremiah, don't pray for them. Here's what God is saying to Jeremiah. I want you to get this. This will help you in a reverse way. You can pray if you want to. I'm not listening to you, Jeremiah. Did you hear what I just stated? All right, so this is really in par with what we do here at Grace, and we've done this for years. People have asked me the question around, you know, how long should I pray for a loved one, you know, that I know is going through some things, struggling with sin and struggling with this and struggling with that, you know, and after a while, I'll, I'll pray for them for maybe three months or six months or a year, and then after a while, I find myself lagging off and not having any compelling to to want to pray for them, and I feel bad, and I say, why are you feeling bad? Are you God? You're not God. Why do you think your emotional fervor for anyone is going to remain perpetually constant until the day you die? What you just discovered again, how weak you are. Right. That should not be new to you. Like God already knew that. Right. He already knew that you were going to wane in your fervency of prayer for somebody. He knew that your own children. You're human. All right. This is what I love about the Bible. When it's properly interpreted, it gives us great clarity on all of our idiosyncratic ways, our unique, fallible ways. And God doesn't have a problem with it. What he often knows is that you and I will pretend to be something we're not. We will pretend to do something we can't. We will pretend to say something that's not right. In this case, God is preempting Jeremiah by letting Jeremiah know there's consequences coming down on your people, bro. And you can pray for them all you want to, but it ain't going to help. Did you hear what I just stated? You can pray for him if you want to. Now, God had already said this back in chapter five to Jeremiah about the priesthood. Right. To whom much is given, much is what? Wow. Jeremiah, don't pray for these priests. They bear rule by their own means. The prophets prophesy falsely and the people love to have it so. They're under my judgment. Don't you pray for them. Now he's saying to the Lord, your people, he says, thus saith the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. Now, all right, so I'm going to give you the parenthetical here. I'm not going to go here long, but the prophet had the role of intercessory, supplicatory, doxological prayer, doxological prayer, intercessory prayer. And supplicatory prayer. Did y'all hear what I just said? Doxological prayer is when you exalt God in the fullness of all of his attributes. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Supplicational prayer. Lord, you see our needs. You see the emptiness of our supply. Supply our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. Intercessory prayer. Lord, Thwart the enemy's ways, hinder his plans, stop his goals, keep his agendas from advancing on our lives. You guys got that? Um, have you ever heard of imprecatory prayers? Imprecatory prayers are the prayers of bringing judgment on God's enemies. Right. And so there were times when the prophet was to pray for God's wrath to be executed upon the rebels within the covenant framework. God's judgment would be poured upon Jewish people who lived in rebellion of Torah and violated God's covenant. If you don't believe me, read it for yourself. Psalm 69, Psalm 102, and many other of the prophets' writings about let their table be a snare. Bring upon them gross darkness. Bring the very evil upon them that they thought to bring upon us. All right. That's a form of prayer that the priest and the prophet have a right to pray. God says, do not pray for this people for their good. He did not say, do not pray to this of this people for their evil. Did he just teaching you something? Suppose Jeremiah's heart was in total lockstep with God. 
and God's heart was filled with a righteous indignation of judgment because their cup of wrath, their cup of iniquity had been full. Would it have been right for Jeremiah to go, true and righteous are your judgments, O God. Pour out your wrath upon them, for you have been patient with them, long suffering with them, and they have spurned and rejected your counsel, and they deserve your judgments. You be holy and just in this hour, O God. Would he have been right to do it? Of course he would have. Of course he would have. Read your Bible. He, of course he would have. Teaching my seminary students this truth, whether you know it or not, people are always asking, you know, what is God up to in this world? He's up to two things, always only up to two, two things. Everything else is adumbrated under these two. Do you know what they are? Mercy and justice. If you keep those two clear and be able to actually categorize them when they are in play, then you can know what God is up to. When his time of mercy is up, he's pouring out his judgment. And you and I should be discerning men and women. And when it's time to see that God is executing judgment, we have to acknowledge that. God's judgment is on our nation right now. I don't care who you are, the judgment is clear, it's laid out. It's on our nation right now. There's no way that we can identify the present unraveling of our country in the manner in which it's unraveling and call it anything but the justice of God coming down after many decades, yea, even centuries of blessing upon blessing upon blessing. There's no doubt about it. Doesn't make me happy. It just means that I'm clear on what God is doing. Now, here's the next verse I want you to see. Notice what it says in Jeremiah 14, verse 12. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Do you guys see that? So now watch this. I want you to get this now. He expects them at a certain point to pray. He expects them to fast. He expects them to cry. Do you hear me? He says they're going to do it, but it's going to be too late. I'm showing you the God of the Bible, not the God of the church, because you know church folk will tell you God's always there for you. I'm showing you the God of the Bible. So there's a timetable when God shows mercy that where that mercy is spurned. Now, the only thing you can expect is for God to be faithful to himself. You know what the Bible says? If we deny him, he cannot deny himself. If we're faithful to him, he'll be faithful to us. If we deny him, he'll remain faithful to himself. That means he'll bring judgment when it's time to bring judgment and all the saints in the world can cry out. And that's not changing anything. So one of the things the people of God have to make sure that their religion never does is get them into an, adva uh, an adverse state with God. You don't get a Bible to manipulate God. You don't learn religious forms and protocols to try to manipulate God. You don't learn Bible verses in order to try to get God to actually sign off on your agenda. It doesn't work. The one thing everybody in the world is going to learn about God is God acts like God. You know what that means? He does what he wants to. Now, the best thing you and I can do is learn how to get on the same page with God and roll with it. And, uh, and this is how he is in your life and mine. And when the Bible says trust in the Lord, it means we have to lean into the fact that God is sovereign and his judgments are inscrutable. We can't question them and come out well. And that what he does is right and well and good, even though in the moment it may have horrific outward consequences. Here's another example of what I'm talking about that I want us to go through to establish my point. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5, and I'm going to read through 13. We're in the Old Testament. I'm just showing you how fasting was honored of God when it was right, 
when it was not right, whether in its modal expression, its motive, its intent, or in its timing, when it's not right, God doesn't care about your hooping and hollering. This is why I'm, you've never heard me tell us at Grace, we want to be part of the national day of prayer that goes on around the world every year. You never heard me say that. Never once in 26 years. Right, because what... Um, what Western Christianity is, unfortunately, is a is a showmanship religion. It's all about showing off. And then they get to do number indicator numbers. We had 17 million Christians pray today. Oh, that must have moved heaven. Right. You're manipulating people. You're not manipulating God. Now they got that 17 million people on their uh donation list don't they so all the next 364 days you're going to get emails from them about all the agendas that they're under right a sucker is born every day notice what the text says this is Zechariah going to be Zechariah 7 verse 5 if you don't mind Zechariah 7 verse 5 and we're going to read verses uh, uh, 5 through 13 and understand the same thing. Zechariah speaking at the end of the Old Testament age. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priest. Saying when you fast and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did ye at all fast? Unto me, even to me. There you go. So got to pause on that because I got some eternity bound souls in this room. This is why I spent all the time I did in the opening talking about be careful to overcome forms of godliness that have no substantial reality behind them. What a question for the spirit of God to raise. What a question for the spirit of God to raise. Let's say the spirit of God knew you had been on a regiment. You had downloaded, you know, uh, Daniel chapter nine, ten method of praying and fasting, you know, and you, you, you've been practicing it. You've been doing it for a whole year. And then all of a sudden you get a word from the Lord. And the Lord said, did you ever do any of that unto me? See? Now, you, you have a great opportunity to just sit there and lie. Of course, Lord, you have a great opportunity to lie. Or you have an opportunity to sit back and say, was this about God or about me? Right. So I'm doing you a great favor right now, saints. And I'm not saying this in a condescending way. I'm doing you a great favor right now. Because what I'm doing is I'm forcing you to think about what it means to actually have a relationship with God. I really am. And the one thing that will impede your relationship with God, as would be mine, would be for me not to be aware of how dishonest I am in my relationship with God. Do you understand what I just stated? Right. So here God was able to say to his people. He says, in the seventh month, he says, when you mourned in the fifth and seventh month, the fifth and the seventh month of the year, even those 70 years, did you at all fast unto me? This is the 70 years they're in captivity. They went through the facade of praying in the fifth month, praying in the seventh month for 70 years. And God said, did you even once pray to me? I will hold my peace. I would say, Lord, you know. You know. You know. But this is not designed for you and I to scratch our head and try to figure out whether God is playing psychological games with us. The answer still remains the same, and it's this. You and I can be going through an external form of godliness, a mode of religious protocol. You can be earnest about it. You can be sincere about it. You can be passionate about it. You can be consistent about it. And it still all be about you. That's really true. Be all about you. Now notice what he says in verse six. And when you did eat and you did drink, 
Did not you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? This is now the cycle of fasting and celebrating. Fasting and celebrating. This is part of the Jewish protocol. Fast and celebrate. Fast and celebrate. When you did eat and when you did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Now I want you to, now watch this now. We're in the New Testament. How many of you guys know we're in the New Testament? You might know, you might not know. Don't raise your hand. If you don't, I'll help you. Because the Old Testament is filled with New Testament principles as the New Testament is affirmed by Old Testament principles. So an Old Testament precept executed in a New Testament way is done by the Old Testament believer having a sufficient comprehension of Christ so that his faith in Christ, while though in the Old Testament, does not trap him into an Old Testament Christless mode of behavior, but rather a New Testament celebratory mode of behavior even before Christ gets here. That was the whole life of King David as he was making his way to the throne. He would do things like go into the temple and get the showbread from off the altar to feed his men, knowing that the Lord does not so care about the protocol or the sacerdotal order or the bread on that table when the soul is hungry. David was the one that said sacrifice and offerings you do not desire. A broken and a contrite heart. That's what you require. So David was actually worshiping the finished work of Christ in the Old Testament by faith while operating out of the rigors of that Old Testament system pointing to Christ. He was liberated. Am I making some sense? As many of the Old Testament saints were liberated. So now here's the New Testament principle. You ought to know it. It's two places in your Bible, one Colossians 3, the other one 1 Corinthians 10. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, whether you eat or whether you drink, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, so now, so now you and I are right now in exactly the same place as these brothers in the Old Testament. Because when you grab that burger, that veggie burger, do you do it really with an utter sense of thanksgiving to God for the grace to have the option to eat that veggie burger while your brother has the freedom to actually eat a protein burger made out of meat? Or are you just eating it out of the glut of your own lust? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? See, so now here's, here's what God is saying. If you and I are careless about the freedom to eat those things that are designed for the health of our body, which are more normative than engaging in the infrequent period of fasting and prayer and all of that, if in the everyday norm of those things that God has given us, we forget God, why do you think we wouldn't forget God in the midst of a little exercise of selfish, hypocritical fasting and prayer? Do y'all hear me? Right, not me, really. Do you hear the Lord? What I love about what he's saying is this. If you really get the Lord, so this is a lesson about how to learn who God is. Y'all ready? God's, God's simple. He's consistent. He's not complex. He's not overburdensome. He actually is a, he's a freedom spirit. Wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In other words, God is not calling you to behave in some obtuse, distorted fashion that's out of the norm. He loves our normalcy. He just wants us to give him glory for it. This is what I was saying to you in the opening of our class. We've got a few more minutes. We really have to hear what the Lord is saying when he says... Can you make the children of the bridegroom fast when everything they need is right in front of them? Are y'all hearing what I just stated? If, if, if Christ, if, and see, all that requires for you and me is to ask the question, how, how sufficient is Christ to me right now? How present, how full, how superfluous, how all-encompassing, how rich, how complex, how intimate, 
How satisfying is Christ to me right now? How near is Christ to me right now? How abundant is Christ? How, how sensible is his fullness in my life right now? These are all matters of perception. Like for me right now, there is absolutely no grounds for me to fast. There's no grounds for me to fast. And if I do, I'm going to be doing it under pretense and I'm going to be dishonoring the God that is so near me, so dear to me, so absolutely abundantly clear in his favor and grace in my life and goodness in my life. Like right now, Joe, right now, the bridegroom is right here with me. I have no reason not to be operating in the fullness of joy and celebration. What he has done for me over the years up to this very moment. There's not a time for fasting. I can't do that. If I do that, I would be just like like Nehemiah in the presence of Xerxes. And Xerxes said, boy, what you doing with your face all cast down? Am I not the king? Don't I own the whole kingdom? Cannot I give you whatever you need? Why is your face cast down? And Nehemiah trembled, didn't he? Because that was an oxymoronic scenario. Here, the richest, wealthiest king in the world, whom he knew that God had put him in the position that he did. Cyrus knew. And, and Nehemiah was his man. And Nehemiah, what you doing, man? Your visage, your face, your emotional disposition represents me. Right, so now... Listen, saints, what I'm saying is we don't detect it, but it's way more about us than we want to be honest about. Verse seven. Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited? And then what? All right, so stop. So there you go. So you know what the Lord is doing? He's doing what the Holy Ghost does. He always takes history to teach us the lesson. So he's running us back in the days when we were all the way back in Jerusalem, when God had just established Jerusalem, both by David and by Solomon. And every man was living under his vine tree and under his fig tree. And the gold and the silver was in the street like dust. And the crops were flourishing and Israel was prospering and everybody was enjoying, enjoying the wealth of Jehovah and what they did from week to week. Went up to the house of the Lord to praise him for his abundant goodness in their life. That's what I was just describing about my situation. Y'all got that? So now watch this. When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities here around about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, verse 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, execute true judgment. You see it? All right. Let's make some parallels here. You in a time of prosperity and blessing. In a time of prosperity and blessing. And in a time of prosperity and blessing, you are operating out of a fullness. This is the best time for you to be hilarious in your giving. This is the best time for you to be much more like God than you are. This is the best time for you to be able to look around and realize that you have so much excess that it's going to spoil and waste. It's a great opportunity to share with my brothers that don't have. Did y'all understand what I just stated? Exe execute true judgment. So the term judgment there is always discernment. It's always analyzing the situation, recognizing the condition and status of people around you. Rec recognize whether or not God has blessed you to be a blessing. And of course, you know that's the case. Right? But rather than you living out of the fullness of his blessing, which is simply being a reciprocal of his blessing, you hoard his blessing. While you're letting your other brethren kind of just dissipate over there. 
and you're not executing true judgment because you're not looking at them and recognizing, you know what? I remember being there last year. I remember being there last year. Let me peel him off. This is nothing here, man. Let me peel you off. Look, all I'm doing is living under the river flow of God. It's not going to stay with me. It's coming to go. Right. This is how God is speaking to Israel because he had blessed himself and show mercy and compassion and every man to his brother. In other words, this is uh, Romans 2 2 again, a new another New Testament principle. It's the goodness of God that should lead you to repentance. It should change the way you act. God's goodness should stop you from being selfish. Right. Yeah. I mean, that really is a universal national principle for the believer. Why does God bless us to the degree that he does and give us just a bit more than we have in order to give it to somebody else? That really is true. But see, that requires a faith that believes that you are in a relationship with God to meet your need the moment that you are in lack. Verse verse 10. Watch this. And oppress not the widow nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. You can read the book of James chapter 4 and 5 around this again. But now think about what this is saying. So now what God is saying is, if I actually impose upon you as a nation, this is as a nation, don't you get overly guilty as an individual. This is as a a nation. And what that means is individuals with gifts and callings and qualities and stations and offices. You're a counselor. You are a congressman. You are a lawyer. You're a, you're a doctor. You are um, you are a first responder. You're a policeman. You are a teacher, an educator. All of the different fields, right? And God has blessed you. What are you to do with that power? You are to influence the sphere in which you exist. This is called being a witness for God's glory. That's what he wants us to do. Did y'all understand what I'm saying? That's what he wants us to do. Now, notice what he says. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And then he gives this last line. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart, which is the same as oppressing the widow and the fatherless and the poor. Because the moment that you get yours and you forget the vulnerability of the old widow, the old fatherless and the poor, you oppress them. Of course. Of course. Now, think about this. Okay, this is in the community of covenant people. This is in Israel. Like, you don't get to just walk by another fellow Jew and and don't peel him off if he needs something. Right? You do that, you're actually resisting the Holy Ghost. You can do whatever you want to with what I say. You can go out there and give up, give away all your money and misunderstand the application all you want. That's not my point. My point is, is that when God blesses us with resources, he's calling us to responsibility that corresponds with his character and nature. He's also warning us that frequently our elder has told us this. This is why America is in the judgment it is now. For this very thing, one of the wealthiest nations in the world. And look at the the lopsided condition of our culture and our states and our cities. And while I'm about to say it, please understand I'm not making the poor righteous and the rich wicked. I'm not a Marxist. I'm not a socialist. I hate that system. I'm saying that when the poor need help, they need help. It doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter. It's not a matter of them being righteous in their state of poverty. They could be just as hell bound as me. I'm wealthy and they're poor. We're both hell bound. In fact, I'm burning it in hell worse than they are. Right? This is not about anything other than the, the Imago Day operating in the people to whom he has given for a season the privilege of enjoying his blessings in order to remind that poor uh, poor person who only for a moment is maybe only going to be poor for a moment. That person on Skid Row is only going to be there for a moment. I mean, God turns tables like I don't know what. Right? This is how he gets glory. 
And then a lot of our poor brothers and sisters, they're not trying to get to where we are. I don't blame them. Right. This is where you and I don't need to, again, play Marx. Marx was a horrible psychologist. Horrible! He was a horrible sociologist as well. So think about this, child of the living God. When Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, it wasn't, it wasn't because God means for them to be poor just to be poor. That's not what he means. He did say the, of such is the kingdom of heaven. He did say blessed are the poor. Didn't he? He didn't say blessed are the rich. Go look that one up. I'm trying to show you something because I know what happens in our culture with all of the, the, the dust mites of false narratives. It actually dislodges your conviction from biblical truth that would actually frame your thinking right. And you will think more like the secular person than you will the sacred person. It's true. You will say that you don't listen to those narratives, but you hear them all the time. So think about this. What if in God's economy, he knows that there are large segments of poor people all around the world who get along way better at that echelon of life than they would at the next level of complexity and difficulty trying to pay a bunch of bills and the rigors of trying to work and do what they do, that their minds were not made with that for that kind of complexity. And they're glad to be living on a level of subsistence that basically meets their needs every day and are happy about it and love Jesus. And can worship and preach on the streets knowing that all they got is a tent to sleep in. But they thank God because they live in a place where the weather is so good. I don't need to be paying $800 for a room. Listen, that's revolutionary. That's revolutionary. That's liberating. And don't tell me those brothers don't have degrees. Don't tell me that they don't have PhDs. Don't tell me that they're not learned men. Don't tell me that many of them are not eggheads, erudites, that they haven't read the books. Many of them have. They will, they will put you to shame with their knowledge of the world and life. They just don't have the energy to engage in the tenacity of this system that constantly forces you to have to lie to get ahead. Yeah. They're not going to, they're not going to get no blame on my part. I'm, I'm totally down with them. I, I, I get them. And so for me, one of these parachute systems, I got in the back of my head, just now, if, you, I mean, if, if push came to shove, just what kind of tent you going to get? <laughs> what kind of quiet little generator heater you going to get? You know, what kind of clothes you going to wear at night to kind of keep warm? Is it going to be inflatable stuff? How much can you carry? Why wouldn't that happen? It could easily happen. And could I not live for the glory of God with dignity for Christ at that level, as at the level I'm living now? Of course I could. Heaven is not going to fill with, be filled with these tears. All these tears are going to be gone. Do you guys understand what I'm getting at? So this is why Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, uh, 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 judge righteous judgment. Don't judge by the things you see. You talk to some of those people and they'll tell you, no, nah, I'm cool, man. In fact, in many cases, they make a whole lot more money than a lot of us in this room. They just got some habits that they just don't want to give up. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you can't get them off the street. The poor you'll have what you always. I got four more verses and I'm going to stop. Verse 11. But they refused to listen to me, God says. Not only that, and they pulled away the shoulder. Okay. How much effort does God put in to get a hold of his people when he wants to get their attention? He will scream B times early in the morning, sending his prophets day and night. Then he will act providentially in a metaphorical pattern of reaching out and grabbing them by the shoulder. Hey, turn! And like the hard-headed, obstinate child, they turn the shoulder away. Was God trying to get their attention? Of course he was. But you see human responsibility in that metaphor, don't you? A sovereign hand could easily turn you and me. But a sovereign hand is also calling you to turn. 
Are you hearing me? It's calling you to turn. It's calling you to turn. And the sovereign hand will expose the fact that you don't turn because you don't want to turn. I didn't call you. I'm touching you now. And you're turning the shoulder the other way. And you stop the ears. That's exactly what they did before they killed the first martyr of the New Testament church. We'll be back there on Sunday. I saw heaven open. And Jesus, these are the same people right here. Right? Listen to what it says. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder, and they stopped their ears that they should not hear. These are the ones that were fasting. Y'all got that? A few verses back. These are the ones that were fasting. So what, what God was saying was, man, I've been trying to holler at you all year long, and now you're going through this mode of fasting and all this outward stuff, and you acting like I should hear you. I'm not hearing you. Verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as adamant stones, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets, Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. You see it? Now, so I want you to see this. Is there another verse there? Yes. One more. Verse 13. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, that's God, and they would not hear. So they cried, that's the people, and God would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. You guys see that? Now watch this. This is the area in which I am somewhat... Uh, concerned and struggling with where we are in our culture today. Personally. This is why I'm kind of preparing us for a conversation around eschatology that I would hope that grown people would be willing to have. And it's a, it's a view of eschatology that overcomes an escapist mentality or the mentality that somehow you and I only deserve God's favor and blessing on our life and no chastisement. See these people right here in our text? They did not believe when God said, I'm going to punish you. They did not believe when God says, I'm going to bring the judgment against you. They kept living in rebellion, disobedience, shirking the gospel, violating God's laws. And then when they started hearing the the, the snuffing and the huffing and the puffing of the horsemen of the Babylonians way down the road. Guess what they want to do now? Fast and pray. Right? And call on God. And what did God say? It's too late. It's too late. So here's the area in which I am praying to get clarity on how is God going to show up in this next dispensation of his providence in our world. Is he going to come through in what I hold in my game theory as an optimistic contingency? Will God just do something that I don't know that will intervene in what I see is a clear trajectory of calamity for America? He could, but I have no right to actually believe that will occur. He could. I'm praying that it would, and it would be in, it would be it would be inexplicable. In other words, if he did it, I wouldn't be able to explain why God intervened and stopped China from totally taking over America, as it's already done all of the infrastructure of America, because America is sold out. OK, and why our media and why big tech has been able to manipulate the minds of men and women, even in the church. Our elite institutions have permeated the church with false prophets and false teachers and men and women who are so irrational in our educational system. And people are pushing back on it if you have a broad enough uh, periphery of news resources. They're pushing back because they see the insanity. But even the most elite intellectuals that I know, and I'm listening to them all, cannot figure out why this is happening. They cannot figure out why our government is being blinded 
and driven in the path that is being driven. They cannot figure out how it is that there are major power sources above our government, imposing itself on our government, driving our government to behave in the disinterest of the American citizenry. They can't figure out why this is happening. And they're, they're, they're using all the models that any of the higher echelon intellectuals can use. I'm talking to Elon Musk and all of those cats are trying to figure out what's going on. They will never figure it out. Okay? They won't figure this out. Because they actually have rejected the council that fundamentally has the answer to these gaps in their theory. Right. And they won't get the answer from the church either because the church has abandoned this worldview that I'm sharing with you. So when they go into the church, what they get from the church is the same kind of vanity they're operating out of. They will not accept the fact that there is a one true living God that's personal. That he's real. That he's sovereign. That he's in control of everything. And that God says, I govern the nations by putting hooks in their jaws and leading them exactly the way I want them to go. He says, I'm the one that will cause them to err out of the way after so many years of rebelling against me so that the spirit of error will dominate the nations of the world. God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, th these particular categories are not in their philosophical uh, 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 a query agenda. They don't know how to negotiate a sovereign God blinding men, giving them over to corruption, giving them over to maddening agendas. And it's eloquently laid out in my Bible. Eloquently laid out. And what the world should expect when calamity hits a nation it's for the church to stand up and tell that nation the truth. That's what the world should expect. Did you hear me? Yes. Yes. Because the Gentile is blessed by the Jew. Always is. Always blessed by the believer. Always is. And after wrestling and ignoring and fighting against the believer and all their plans don't work, they expect the prophet to rise up and tell them what the hell is going on in our world. That's what they expect. Do you hear me? And when the prophet doesn't rise up, they know game is over. And I don't see any prophets on the horizon rising up, telling our nation, our administration, our government, our congressmen, our senators, you're in trouble. And here's the way out. You know, it's really, it's so fascinating. Think about it. Saying, we're getting ready to pray in a moment. Think about it. For all of the mess that Billy Graham preached, because he got trapped by the uh, by the deep state as well. He hated it in his early, in his latter days. One of the things he said before he entered into full dementia was, I hate that so much of my ministry was about me. That's what he constantly stated. But see, this is how the devil will trick you and make you popular. He makes it all about you. The Billy Graham ministry. In his youth, he would have trembled at the very turn. But as he became popular, it became comfortable for him to be the man. No flesh shall glory in his sight. As he started going downhill, as we all will do, and he started becoming more fearful, as old men do, he had to look back on his works and realize he told a bunch of stories that were not true. He led a bunch of people down the aisle to the front of the auditorium that never was at the front door of heaven. He knows that. He knows that. He knows that they were propped up. He knows that those numbers were fictitiously manipulated. He knew that. Do you hear me? He knew that. Because 
religious religious cons are big in our world. And I, I was thankful that he would just say, I, 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 I repent, I repent, I repent, I, I repent. I repent. Here's the problem. He didn't get a, he didn't get in front of the microphone in front of 380 million people and do it. Did you hear what I just stated? He didn't say hand me a microphone. Because he could have did it many times. And I went, well, God's not giving him a microphone because God's bringing judgment against America. And there's nobody. But back in the day in his youth. He just stood up and told America, your problem is adultery. Your problem is fornication. Your problem is addiction. Your problem is alcohol. Your problem is that TV, that devil box. He was right about all that. He was right about all of it. You can be sure of that. But we don't, there is not, you don't, where is it coming from today? Nowhere. This is how you know we're under the judgment of God. And yet God could come through and be merciful to us. Of course, I want him to. I got a bunch of little grandbabies like that one over there. I got a bunch of little grandbabies. I want them all growing up in a, in a, in a, in a state that prospers and, and matures and develops. But what I want doesn't matter a hill of beans. So I, I want to encourage you guys to be mature about where we're going in our studies. And, uh, and don't be quick to pull a trigger about knowing anything about the way the Lord is going to act and be in the years to come. Don't do that. You don't have to. You didn't know what the Lord was going to be up to all these years that he kept you up to this last second. Now, all of a sudden, you got to know how the Lord's going to come and whether or not the Antichrist is going to be in Europe or in Israel. All that stuff is such a distraction. Such an abominable distraction. I'm looking forward to explaining and exposing a bunch of that in the weeks and months to come.